Good evening, my name is Arlene Herson. The name of the show is Getting to Know You, and that's exactly what we're going to do tonight. We're going to get to know a man who is jack of all trades and master of them all. A man who proves that you can do many things and do them all well. He is an actor on stage, screen, and television, a folk singer and guitarist, lecturer, author, and scriptwriter. He is also a concerned human being, active in politics, charity, and world affairs, a man with strong beliefs and the courage to voice them. He is Theodore Bikel, and let's get to know him right after these messages, so please stay right there. I don't know, I'm missing something there. This is New Guinea. Mm. It's so powerful. I don't see it. I'm having an out-of-decade experience. <laughs> I was walking and came upon a fountain which bore the sign, Don't Drink the Water. Do you get this? Carries a Isn't sign it fantastic? Saying, what does this poem mean to me? It's like a collage of images Let's and face sounds. it, not every cultural activity appeals to everyone. Finding an oasis. So we're giving you something everyone likes. A choice. That's why 23,000 arts and humanities groups are inviting you to find something you can get excited about. Just call for a free brochure about what's going on in your community. I think I'm getting into this. They're tuning up. The arts and humanities, there's something in it for you. There's a lot going on in your community. For a free brochure on how to get involved, call our toll-free number. What would make this 60-year-old woman reveal her breasts to someone she doesn't know? It would have to be for a very good reason, like getting a mammogram. A doctor told her the older she gets, the higher the risk of breast cancer. But early detection increases her chance of successful treatment. Getting a mammogram might just save her life especially if you're over 50. Call the American Cancer Society. Early detection is the best protection. We're back. We're with my very special guest, Theodore Bikel. We're here at the Regency Hotel in New York City. Welcome, and I thank you for taking the time. I know today's a busy day for you in New York mm -hmm. and uh, for taking the time to being on my show. Thank you. But, you know, as I mentioned in the introduction, you do have a very, very diversified career and have from the very beginning. In doing my research about you, there was an article that was written way back. It was actually around 1960, so that's a long time ago. But it called you because you were very active then. The article was entitled, The Star Nobody Knows. That even though you were very active in, uh, on Broadway, radio, television, guitarist, folk singer, that you would often go on the street and be unrecognized. Is that true today in the 1980s? Well, not really, because uh, I've had this beard for a long time, <laughs> and so it, that's distinctive. And uh, I guess, especially in New York, and uh, I, I get I get recognized. I'm, luckily, it's not like Paul Newman; they don't tear clothes <laughs> off my back. But, but uh, it, it, I get recognized. Uh, did it bother you then when you were doing so much? No, did you? no, no. I, I, I'm never bothered. I, I am. I am pleased and flattered when people do recognize me. I'm not bothered when they don't. It's fine. <laughs> I do my work. Okay. And, uh, all I want to do is to do it well. And you do it well. As I mentioned, you do so many things. But not only is your career diversified, actually your life has been very, very diversified. You have lived in many countries. You were born in, in Vienna, lived in, in Israel, lived in England, live in the United States. I heard that before you were 10 years old, you could speak three languages fluently. That's quite true, yes. I, I, and I've acquired a few since. I speak seven and I get, uh, and I say, well, I speak five very well. I get by in two more. And uh, I sing in 21. Wow, okay. <laughs> now, just to go back, three languages before you were 10. Mm. Why three languages? Well, I spoke one language with my grandmother, another with my mother, and another with my father. Okay, Hebrew? Yiddish and, and, uh, and German. And German. Okay, yeah. English you learned later? English I learned later. Okay. Came later. Came later. <gasps> All right, you're very fortunate. Actually, when you mentioned speaking different languages, you, I understand your parents were absolutely exceptional people. Well, my father was uh, really uh, extraordinary. He, he worked uh, strange jobs like in insurance companies and stuff, but that was strictly speaking jobs. He would. He would go to lectures, he would later give lectures, he would, on, on Tuesday nights, we would sit around the table and he would read plays, whole plays, either in Yiddish or in, or in Hebrew. It was really quite an extraordinary household. Yeah, very, very fortunate to have parents like that, but there was a time you weren't so fortunate. 
1938, I think, was the year. You had to leave the country you love. You had to leave Vienna. Um, I never really loved Vienna, I, I, neither then nor in retrospect. Uh, uh, it was a place where, where I was born and spent my childhood, but uh, we were never um, accepted, nor, nor did we feel accepted. So I didn't start to love countries <laughs> until later. That's interesting. What do you mean you weren't accepted? Uh, we were Jews. That, that meant being outcasts, uh, always second-class citizens, even, even b before there was overt, overt persecution. Okay, that was the reason, obviously, that, that you left mm -hmm. Vienna uh, when the Nazis came in, but you felt it all your life? Oh, yes. Oh, oh yes. All the time. We, were, we spoke German. In fact, I spoke a better German than many of my contemporaries who were not Jewish. Uh, but. Uh, it was uh, culturally one felt at home, but uh, certainly emotionally one didn't. So when the time came to leave, but that must have been a very emotional time too. Was it easy to well, get out? Well, it the was Nazis emotional or? only because you leave everything that you've known and you leave things is what you leave. But uh, I looked forward to, to Israel. I really yeah. did. I spoke its language. I, I was steeped in the culture. It didn't bother me in the least. Okay. Was it difficult to get out of Vienna at that time? Didn't oh, yes. You? Oh, yes. It, we were one of the very few uh, fortunate ones who managed to escape the clutches of Hitler uh, uh, living there. We lived under Hitler for, for uh, six months. And we managed to get out because my father had been such a, an activist and was given one of the few available visas that the British gave out. Hmm. Now we know where you get your background from <laughs> being an activist and being you were very, very lucky. Did you feel personally threatened at any time? You were only oh, yes. about 13. Uh, they used to come into our classroom and, and beat us up. Hmm. It was there, with official sanction, by the way. Oh, you mean it's okay yeah, to beat the up the teachers, Jews? Yeah, uh, the teachers told us there was a general assembly and the, and the headmaster said, you know, if in the, in the first, I'm translating very accurately, if in the first exuberance of joy over the new regime some excesses should happen, we will not be um, able to stop them. And it was quite clear that he wasn't willing to stop them either. Wow. Okay. Well, thank heavens you got out and to Israel, a place where you felt, I mean, certainly that was just yeah. the opposite, where you felt very comfortable being a Jew, but, oh, yeah. but not... The, the, the interesting thing, of course, is that it gives me a, as much background as I need to play Fiddler on the Roof, because that's precisely where that, where that ties in, you know. There's, there's tolerance at first uh, in, in, a, in a tentative way and then persecution, and then pogroms, and then leaving in order to, to get to a new place where you, where you can feel safe. All of that happens in Fiddler on the Roof, yeah. and it happened in my life, too. That's interesting. I was going to bring that up mm. because, uh, which we will mention, you are starring in Fiddler on the Roof again. Mm. Uh, you've played that role many times, and obviously mm. with more feeling yeah. uh, because of your background. And uh, you're going to be at Claridge Hotel um, in Fiddler on the Roof, starring in it again. Um, is it different when you adapt, to just for the, because you are going to be in Atlantic City with Fiddler on the Roof, do you play differently in Atlantic City? No. Then no. It's still the entire show. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it, it is a, a, a condensed version of it. You, you do, because we're doing it twice nightly, so you're doing a shorter show, but it is basically, it's all there. It's, it's cu it is cut down, scaled down to that size, but you don't lose any of the essential elements mm. of the show. Okay, very special show, yeah. but again, uh, you know, a, a subject that's so close to you, but when you went to Israel, mm -hmm. your first job on a kibbutz, I understand, was farming. Now, yeah, I hated it. Uh, yes, I hear. I stand it. <laughs> it said you had I a was, yellow thumb. I have no, <laughs> I, I have no aptitude or inclination toward agriculture, except that I felt uh, I, ideologically that you should be a farmer when you're there. Uh, but uh, it didn't turn out that way. I would, I would stand around, usually on on heaps of manure and singing songs about the beauty of the work, which I was not equipped to handle. <laughs> okay, well, farming, that's where I maybe I was singing, so that's how farming ended. Your life's work has been in the theater, and, and I read something that you said about somebody going into the theater in, in one of the articles about you, and it said that you tell would-be actors that if they find that their soul can survive away from the theater, then they should stay away. But if they find that they'd rather die than stay away, then the theater is where they belong. Did you have that driving force? Oh, yes. Oh, yes, yes. I, I felt, you know, when I first went into the theater, and I was quite young, I was, I was 19, 
um, professional, you know, in a full sense. Um, everybody tried to tell me, including my family, that uh, there's no security in the theater, there's no assurance that one would ever make a living in it. And uh, would I do something else to have something to fall back on? And that, that is what made me uh, pass university exams and stuff. I could always be a, an academician, a teacher, a linguist, a translator, whatever. And um, then I said to myself, do I want to stay away from the theater? And I put, the, put it in, in my mind, can I survive if I stay away from the theater? And I said, no, I, I, I would die. I literally, uh, certainly emotionally would die, not, not, not actually, but emotionally. Uh, and I would just vegetate. And so I said to myself, that's really the criterion. If you find that you cannot survive uh, emotionally uh, away from the theater, then I guess you belong in the theater. Yeah, okay. And obviously, you know, it's, for you it hasn't just been the theater. It's also a whole different career. You could have had two separate careers. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but all that is part of theater. What I do on a concert stage is theater, too. I tell, I, I'm basically a communicator, a raconteur, a, a storyteller. Whether I tell it musically or tell it in words is, is one and the same thing. Okay, well, I want to find out how it all evolved and how it all fits together. But we're going to take a commercial break, and then we're going to come back, and we're going to talk some more. We're speaking with Theodore Vickel. We're here at the Regency Hotel in New York City. We'll be right back after these messages, so please do not go away. Your approach is looking good, Cobra. The men and women in the National Guard and Reserve face some tough challenges when they serve. Challenges that teach them discipline, leadership, and technical skills that make them better employees. So when they need time off to serve, don't make their toughest challenge. Approaching you. My hero, Isaiah Thomas. Kevin Costner. Mr. Wong. These are teachers, but to the kids they've reached, they're heroes. My hero, Mrs. Wooten. If I don't get through to that child, who knows, maybe no one else will. Teachers have the power to wake up young minds, to be heroes, to make a difference. Reach for that power. Teach. Find out how by calling 1-800-45-TEACH. Be a teacher. Be a hero. In a life-threatening emergency, you should know what to do. Say a loved one exhibits unusual symptoms. The first thing to do is... Clear! No. The first thing to do... Oh! Tourniquet! No! The first thing you do is pick up the phone and dial your emergency number. Call 911 first. Right. How about mouth to mouth? I don't think so. Hmm. To learn more about life-saving techniques, contact your Red Cross. We're back with my very special guest, Theodore Bikel. We're here at the Regency Hotel in New York City. And, um, well, the air conditioning broke down. Yes, okay. <laughs> That's a, but it's a wonderful hotel. <laughs> so I have to say, and, and I'm very thankful to them, and I stay here all the time. It really is one of the nicest That's hotels in New York City. That's why we look a little But today, we're having a little, it's a little warm here. <laughs> but anyway, we were talking about acting and theater being part of your life and, and also the concerts. But I understand the guitar came into your life by accident. Literally, yes. Yeah. Somebody forgot a guitar where I lived. Um, in, in the kibbutz where I, where I worked. And I picked it up and uh, started fooling around with it. And that's how it, how it came to it. Did you just, did you know how to read music? Did you know no, how to play? I, did oh, you just, I never did took just... lessons. I, I just picked it up. I, I listened to the fingers. <laughs> ah, that's incredible. Mm. Have you learned to read music? Yes, but I'm, I'm, my ear is better than my eyes. So I really play everything that I play more by by ear and by in intuition than I do by uh, looking at it. Isn't that interesting? I look at texts more than I do at music. You mentioned that you can sing in, did you say 21? 21, 21 languages. Different languages. How and why did you learn to sing in so many languages? Well, uh, since I'm a linguist anyway, by, by uh, um, aptitude and a little bit by training, uh, I figured I might as well do that ex extended in, into the performing. And uh, I'm, a, I'm one of the few people in, in, in America who, who does that. There are very few who do. Yeah, that's true. Well, because I'm the only Romanian, one. Hungarian, yeah. Greek, yeah. Zulu. Right. All Zulu. of that. Ukrainian. <laughs> various 
Well, how did you learn? Well, you learn by listening, and I listen very well, and I, I'm able to translate what I, what I hear in, into, um, well, analyze it, and then make my mouth do it. <laughs> okay. Well, I, I, incredible, but your mouth do it, your mouth, you do so many, you've played so many different kinds of roles. I mean, you, you've played a Russian, you've played a German, you've played an American, you've played a Scottish policeman in um, Sound of Music on Broadway, the role that you originated. You were an, an Austrian. Austrian nobleman. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> okay, also you were fleeing Austria, um, actually an Austrian fleeing Austria. Did that bring back any memories of? Oh yes, sure. Of your life? I mean, there are, there are analogies. In some roles, they're simply uh, you have to reach very far. I mean, if you play a murderer, there's very little reference in your own life. You, you, you never, I've never been a murderer, but, and I've nev never really had murderous impulses, so you have to reach far to play it. Uh, you play a king, well, I've never been a king, although from time to time one has felt noble, I hope. Uh, so, but you have to reach for those. There's some things uh, that you can reach into your knapsack and come up with something that, that uh, gives you a parallel point of um, reference. But you don't have to be a murderer to play a murderer. No. <laughs> right. Okay. When no, you, you have to be a good actor. Yeah. <laughs> right. Okay. It's, um, again, and I keep bringing up all the things that you've done because acting, singing, um, you've also had your own radio show. Yeah. Oh, yes. For a number of years, I had a radio show called Theodore Bikel at Home, which was a whimsical title because at home was literally where I happened to be. And the show came from just anywhere. It came from uh, New York at first and then from on the road. And I, I was in, in Greece uh, shooting a movie, and so it came from Athens for a few weeks. And then it was in, uh, from the N Namibia desert where I did another film. Uh, it was any place. Okay, very active, doing all these things, having a weekly radio show. I used to mail in tapes. I, I mailed one master tape to um, a guy in New York who duplicated it and then shipped it around the country. <laughs> wow, okay. I hear that in addition to playing, fa to playing folk songs on it, it was an interview show and you could express your opinions because you've oh, always yeah. had very sure. strong opinions. I hear because of those opinions you didn't have any sponsors on the show. That's true. <sighs> I, perhaps that was good because I really, uh, I was dictated to by no one. And uh, not that necessarily having sponsors means that, that they interfere with the content of the show, but it makes it a little more confined, I guess, in your own mind rather than because they want you to be. Uh, this way, I had not, none, no yeah. confinement. Okay. Interesting. Did you, you did interviews. Did yeah. you like doing interviews? You were on the oh, other yes. side. No, no I, I liked it very much. I interviewed very diverse people. I mean, Archbishop Macarius of Cyprus, uh, when he was in exile, was an, a prime example. It was a, an interview that, that very few people got. Yeah. And uh, it was good. Okay. At Home with Theodore Bikel is what the radio program was called, but different at home now with Theodore Bikel. At Home with Theodore Bikel is in Connecticut. Mm -hmm. You have, um, where you live with your wife and two sons. Your wife, Rita, is, um, you've been married for a long time, your second wife, but I understand she's also your manager. Yeah, that's true, yeah. Is that a conflict? No, on the contrary, it works very well. Conflict with what? <laughs> she doesn't have any other clients. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. Well, did she become your manager before or after? No, you after, after, after. 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 Okay. She does it better than other people. Well, that's... Yeah. You both have a mutual yeah. interest. I think that's yeah. terrific. And I've heard terrific things about her. As a matter of fact, a friend of mine, you do all kinds of things. A friend of mine won you one time. In a, at a charity function, you were her prize, and she had lunch with you. Oh, yes, that's right. Okay. I, she won a luncheon with me and some scintillating conversation. <laughs> okay, now, isn't that dangerous? I mean, you don't no. know who you're going to wind up for the day with, is it? Well, how dangerous can it be? You take a lady to, to a restaurant and you, and you chat. <laughs> okay, is that something you do often? Uh, no, I've, I've been one, only one. No, I've been one twice in that fashion and then once many years ago i was on, on on the dating game and i won a lady oh and so i took her to dinner <laughs> big deal <laughs> okay you were married once before a long time ago when you were younger um, an israeli girl i I, you, I used to be older yeah. actually yeah <laughs> oh younger now <laughs> you know i feel that oh you you say it joking yeah. Yeah. but i really feel yeah. younger than i did so. several years ago yeah. 
Okay, but your career was very hectic at that time. You married for two years. Mm. Timing, I think. Yeah, it was. It was very. I mean, it was when I just after I'd come to America the first time. It was. Um, it was very hectic, and uh, not a good time really to get married. Yeah. When you came, you became an American citizen in 1961. Yeah. Was it? Mm -hmm. Okay. Before that, you were born in Vienna. Went to Israel. Went to England. Were you a British subject? Were yeah. You, oh yeah. You know, before? Sure. I, when I, I, it was when I was in Israel. It wasn't even Israel then. It was Palestine. So that was British at the time, and then I, when I went to England uh, to study, I simply retained my British nationality until I became an American. Right. So yeah. I've had three passports in my time. <laughs> okay. But th that's enough. Yeah. That's, I'm, I'm staying in America. I'm not <laughs> going anyplace else. Good. Okay. And we're going to take a break, and then we're going to come back and talk some more. Well, we're speaking with Theodore Bikel. We're at the Regency Hotel in New York City. We'll be right back after these messages, so please stay right there. Excuse me. Do you wear your safety belt? Why, no. I don't wear my safety belt. Thank you. could learn a lot from a dummy. Buckle your safety belt. <laughs> oh. Hey, what's going on? Shh. Smokey's coming. What are you guys up to? <laughs> oh. Be careful with matches and campfires. Remember, only you can prevent forest fires. Sorry, force of habit. Bummer. We're back. We're with my guest, Theodore Bikel, here at the Regency Hotel in New York City. Uh, we were just talking between the break, and you had mentioned you're not Johnny One Note, which is another thing. You're really not. You do so much. You described yourself one time as a general pa practitioner as opposed to a specialist. If you had to specialize in one thing, what would it be? Uh, I would specialize in diversity. <laughs> <laughs> okay. No, I, I really, I, I couldn't say that. It would be terrible to say I'm, I'm going to give up everything else and, and just act or just sing or just uh, write or just think or just be a human being. I can't do that. You have, to, you have to use every faculty that you have. Uh, subject to the limitations, I cannot play a 16-year-old um, midget. I, that's a limitation. I can't do that. O outside of that, anything that uh, I can do, I do. Okay, but when you were something like in your 30s, you were playing men in their uh, 80s at one yes, point. Yes, I was. So it, was. It is possible as a 30-year-old actor to play an 80-year-old man. You cannot be um, 55, 60, 70 and play a 30-year-old credibly. Cannot. Some people okay. have tried. Okay. You can be an opera singer that weighs 400 pounds and, and pretend to be a, a youngster. But um, Well, they don't do that. They're much more realistic yeah. even in opera these days, yeah. you know, I find. You also have said that you view your, your work and your life in terms of survival. Yeah, it's true. It is. Well, th there's a, a... We are threatened with extinction, all of us, you see, by so many elements. Uh, they are a very mode of living uh, tends to um, threaten us uh, with uh, the pollution of the elements. Uh, everything. We, we may be headed for uh, uh, down a, a terrible suicidal path and so whatever you do has to be viewed in terms of, of survival, cultural survival, physical survival. Uh, the fact that I sing songs of all these nations and folk songs in particular, some of which have been around for hundreds of years, is also an effort to um, keep alive things and not relegate them to the museum shelf or the bookshelf. Okay, and, so, yeah, and a song that's sung is a, is, a, is a song that's alive. A song that is merely uh, researched by, by academicians is dead. Hmm, okay, well you keep things alive. You keep obviously in your folk songs, but you also are very outspoken. You're very involved in the Democratic Party. Um, I received a letter from you, as a matter of fact, a few years ago, supporting a senator, Carl Levin, uh, mm. for election. You had felt 
in part of what you had felt as a supporter of Israel, he was therefore targeted for defeat. You wrote a personal. He was targeted for defeat by the radical right, which the radical right sometimes skirts the edges of anti-Semitism very often. And so they picked on, on a, a Jewish senator in particular and attacked him for being a supporter of Israel, as though that betokened dual loyalty, which mm -hmm. it doesn't. Yeah, but you wrote a personal letter that went out to many, many, many thousands of people, uh, signed by Theodore Bikel. I mean, that's really kind of putting yourself way out in front. So why not? Why not? I, I can give you a lot of reasons why yes, and why? none why not. Okay, some why yes. Well, commitment. <laughs> I'm not just a, a, a human. I owe things. I owe. I owe history. I, I, I owe my own sense of dignity. I owe. So I pay the debt yeah. whenever I can. Good. And you do. And you've been so involved. Also, as I mentioned in politics, have you ever thought, have you ever been approached? Yes, to run many for times. I've been approached to run for office. I always turned it down. I do better where I am than, than where I I hope to hold elective office. Yeah, on the stage. Mm -hmm. And saying, how do you feel on the stage? Speaking about on the stage, because I want to... I'm sorry, you... Yeah, I'm, that's all right. I, I don't abuse my, my... I don't lure people into the theater promising them a performance and give them a political speech. I never do that. But I do use my position, as everybody does, in order to... and my visibility to um, espouse the causes that I believe in. Mm -hmm. Important. You once described... You once said that your father asked one thing of you, and that was to be a mensch. For the people out there that don't know what a mensch is, can you tell us? It's a human being with a, an, an added note of, uh, uh, of dignity. <sighs> well, I Anybody would... is a human being, but a dignified human being is something else. <sighs> okay, well, I'm sure if your father was here right now, he would say, my son, Theodore Bikel, is a mensch. And uh, I have to say that I really thoroughly have enjoyed having you here on my show. I thank you very much for being a guest on my show, and I wish you luck. Fiddler on the Roof, 1,000 It will be. I will, I will exceed 1,000 performances in this engagement at the, at the Claridge in Atlantic City. Wow. <laughs> okay, well, I have exceeded my hopes in, in having you on my show because you've been terrific, and I thank you very much for being here. Thank you. I hope that you have enjoyed getting to know Theodore Bikel. I know that I certainly have, and that you join us again next week. Meantime, good night. It's been a pleasure getting to know you.